But today I'm going to show you how I use Online Med Ed, which is an online resource that's partic particularly useful for Step 2 CS and Step 2 CK. It's also really useful to use Online Med Ed when you're doing your clerkship year when you're in the hospital because it's a lot of clinical medicine. So today I'm going to show you how I utilize that website to make flashcards. But before I begin, uh, this video is sponsored by Nerdcore Medical. It's the third of five videos they have actually sponsored on my channel. They have a bunch of cool products on their website like this one, which is called Occam's Razor. What it's used to doing is taking very common diseases like pyelonephritis, appendicitis, cholecystitis, and matching them to common symptoms. Uh, and this is a game I actually enjoy playing a lot. And um, so yeah, just go check them out, nerdcoremedical.com. I'll link the website down below. Uh, and thanks for, to them for sponsoring this video. So now let's move on. that I will point out is all of online med ed's videos are free so by me showing you any of this there's no like infringement or anything like that uh you should go check them out yourself but yeah i just wanted to make that disclaimer let's get to it As I said, this is online med ed. You should definitely go check it out if you haven't already. It's more useful for step two related material and more for clinical reasoning. And today I'm gonna to show you how I make flashcards using online med ed. I have Anki open on the side right here and um, I have my video going, so let's go. Well, higher up you come to the bladder. At the level of the bladder. So as you already noticed, I'm using, um, <laughs> I'm using 2x speed to go faster. Uh, and I almost always do that just because it helps me get through the material fast. Skipped a bit ahead, but I'm going to just keep going and see how this goes. The ultrasound is usually the first step. What the ultrasound does really well is not show you where the ureters are or where the kidney is, but it shows you it's hydro or not. And hydro is usually associated with instruction. But in the case of kids, it could also be reflux. So wouldn't it be cool if you had a test that could differentiate if you have hydro, is it from instruction, or is it from reflux? Well, the voiding assisted is just that. When you put a catheter in and inject dye into the bladder, you remove the catheter and have the kid pee. The bladder should contract and all of the dye should go through the urethra. That's normal. But it ends up in the ureters for some reason. That's a sign that there's reflux. So the voiding system ureterogram really is designed to show you reflux or no. So this is a good one. What is the what is the diagnostic test to test if someone has vesiculoureteral reflux? And it's a VCUG, which is avoiding cystoureterogram. Okay, so you'll see I'll make that a closed deletion, and I'm also going to just go ahead and take a screenshot of this just for some context, and I'll do that, and I'll move forward. Actually, one thing I also didn't do in my last card is I kind of want to explain how VCUG works, so I'm going to just write that down in italics here. So you inject, inject dye into the bladder, and then have the patient pee, and all the dye should come out of the urethra if no reflux is present. If it is present, then you may have dye go up the ureter. So as I said again, this is just clarification on my end. I always like having more detail than less, so I just added that on. All right, let's keep going. Something blocks the urine from getting out of the bladder. And as the bladder gets bigger, it's only going to go one way, and it's back up the ureters because that's going to lead hydro. So the patient may already know about this, but one of the ways you can assess this is when they have prenatal care, they're going to have oligohydramnios. Oligohydramnios because amniotic fluid is created by baby's urine. I see. Okay, see, this is a good one. Uh, if a baby has a posterior urethral valve, will they have oligo or polyhydramnios? Um, and the answer here is oligo because the baby won't be able to urinate. Excess tissue in the urethra. You can't get the urine out of the bladder. Well, there's not going to be any amniotic fluid. And that's probably going to prompt ultrasound too. And you might actually see the prenatal diagnosis by seeing hydro on a prenatal ultrasound. Evaluate. Chances are they're not going to be nice to you. So they're going to give you a patient who doesn't have prenatal care, undocumented immigrant, someone who just arrived from another country, and now baby's being born. I don't have this When you remember this, think of an erect penis. What is supposed to happen when you transform a female into a male is you grab the top of the vagina and the bottom, turn them into zippers, and literally just pull out and zip everything up. That is, the labia forms the scrotum, the clitoris expands, and the urethra comes with it. And the idea is that you zip them together so that they fold in the middle, and the urethra opens in the middle. Well, if one zipper moves too fast or the other one too slow relatively, the urethra is going to end up in a different spot. You get the erect penis, erect, on top, epi, dorsal. Smart. Hypo, bottom, ventral. This guy is smart. I like him. If it helps you remember it, epispadius will cause the kid to pee in his own face. Now, you're going to notice this, and it's there. The diagnosis is made clinically, and babies are incontinent in urine anyway, so you actually don't really care for the first couple of years they're diapers. But eventually you want to get that cosmetic formally fixed so that they can actually pee like normal. The thing you have to know for your test, the thing you have to know for life, is that you never do a circumcision. 
you need that extra tissue to rebuild the urethra. You're going to need the foreskin to reconstruct the penis for the urethra. So this is how I know stuff is high yield. See, like whenever he says something like this, like the key or like this big thing, that's when I know there's a thing. So here, what procedure is contraindicated in patients with hypo and epispadius? And it's a circumcision because need the extra tissue to fix the epi slash hypo spadius. All right. So as I said, again, I always include reasoning and there it is. And I'll put it right here. But generally the way this presents is going to be a teenager. A teenager who's been through life without any difficulty. And then they have the first alcohol binge. Drink a bunch of beer. At the same time, they're taking a large volume of beer and they're having large diuresis from the alcohol. That then produces a colicky abdominal pain. So in this case, this is a good one. Um, what is the typical presentation? What is the typical first time presentation for someone who has a ureteral pelvic uh, junction um, block? And in this case, imagine a teenager. I'm just giving a hint here because some this this question is actually very vague in terms of like, what do you mean by presentation? So in this case, it's a teenager who drinks alcohol for the first time. Um, and I think the reasoning for this, let's rewind and re-listen, because sometimes I do need to do that. Symptoms. But then once the thyroid blood is good, and diuresis. But generally the way this presents is going to be a teenager. A teenager who's been through life without any difficulty. Then they have their first alcohol binge, drink a bunch of beer. At the same time, they're taking a large volume of beer, and they're having large diuresis from the alcohol. That then produces a colicky abdominal pain. I see. Okay. Alcohol is high volume and also high diuresis, which for the first time challenges the obstruction and leads to colicky pain. Patient usually okay afterwards. The ectopic ureter is always going to implant above the external sphincter, which means that it doesn't matter. In boys, completely asymptomatic. But in girls, girls are going to have a normal urinary behavior. Like the good ureter is going to bladder, bladder gets too big, she's going to go, and she voids. So there's normal function. And because that other ureter can implant below the external sphincter, or into the vagina, what she's going to have is a constant leak. And she will never have been dry because she's had an anatomic deficiency. A gentle defect, which prevents her from holding her ear. Okay, this is interesting, and I don't think I quite understood it, so I need to read, listen to it. But it's saying men are asymptomatic, right? Implant above the external sphincter, which means that it doesn't matter. In boys, completely I asymptomatic. But in girls, it. girls are going to have a normal urinary behavior. Like the good in your ear is going to bladder, bladder gets too big, she feels like she needs to go, and she avoids. So there's normal function. And because that other ear can implant below the external sphincter or into the vagina, what she's going to have is a constant leak. And she will never have been dry because she's had an anatomic deficiency, a gentle defect, which prevents her from holding her ear. Got it, got it. Diagnosis got it. is going to begin. So here's a good one. Why is an ectopic ureter usually asymptomatic in males? Because it usually implants, a, usually implants above the external urethral sphincter. And thus, the man still has voluntary control over the urinary, urinary pattern. Okay, so there's the reason why an ectopic ureter is usually asymptomatic in males. But now here's the opposite question that I'm going to also include, which is, why is the ectopic ureter usually more likely to be symptomatic in females? And that's because, because it can attach to the vagina, which does not have an external urethral sphincter, and thus the woman consistently presents with a leak. In men, the external urethral sphincter prevents this. So notice how I no included all of that, and uh, that that's my second card.
The idea here is that this is going to present very similarly to a fistula, except she's not having a reason to have a fistula, she's going to be five years old. So think of ectopic ureter when a girl is having normal bladder function and at the same time is dry. Lastly, we're going to talk about the ureteral. Right, if we go back over this lecture, we talked a little bit about a differential based on anatomy. We talked about nutria. We talked about the diagnostic test and how you're normally going to go ultrasound for existing research. Then we ran through the major diseases you've got to know from urology. Posterior retural valves, no urine on day one, descend the bladder, decompress the bladder. Hyphen the don't circumcise, you're going to need that tissue to rebuild the penis and the ureter. For ureteral pelvic junction obstruction, look for the hydro in the kidneys, but no hydro in the ureter, and a teenager who has a high volume load and it looks like an obstruction, but only a high flow rates. A topic ureter is the girl who has normal function and is a constant leak, who's never been dry. The sigula ureteral reflux is going to be the kid who has a prenatal diagnosis or is going to present recurrent UTIs by a That's it. Why does someone with vesiculo ureteral reflux present with recurring UTIs in childhood? Um, because the microbiota, and this wasn't explicitly mentioned, I'm just saying this in because it's something I just thought of, um, of the bladder move backwards which is not normal and thus can lead lead to UTIs and pylo. All right so that's my last card and notice notice how we're done with this video and I didn't make that many cards because I keep it very succinct I try to keep it very straightforward um, and so this shows you how to make Anki flashcards using online method. Hope you guys found this helpful I'll see you in the next video like comment share and subscribe uh, peace